Welcome to segment three of Citizens Forum. Our guest in the segment is John Farquharson, and uh, John is a regular, and we're going to be talking about a couple of things. <coughs> First is a sewage update. Dispatches from the sewage front, yes. <laughs> 30 days later. Yeah, well, there's lots happening, so... Well, lots has happened, because the last time I was here, it was just after the view field, as they often refer to it, the view field fiasco, and so I was updating you on the, uh, on the open houses. But since then, there's been a lot, again, happening. Um, as you know, the Squimalt turned down the CRD's rezoning application for McLaughlin. So I was disappointed because I thought the CRD might take a few uh, cues from um, other jurisdictions, such as the Squimalt or the Bufield Residence Group. And uh, as they pushed back against the CRD, my hope was the CRD might go back and push back a bit against the feds or against the province. But they don't. They have this. They have this military-like mindset. It's, you know, uh, we have been ordered to do this. Authority and compliance. Authority and compliance. You do not ask questions. You just comply, comply, comply. So it's like you know, you know, Captain CRD was having difficulty with Sergeant Esquimalt, so they appealed to the General Province for more authority to force Sergeant Esquimalt into shape. So that's where it stands right now. They've asked for, you know, some sort of, uh, I don't know, Section 38 or something like that, some sort of authority on the part of the province to override the uh, McLaughlin or the Esquimalt Council's uh, uh, declining of the uh, CRD application. And that's, of course, that is the major site of where all of this is going to be going. So if, if Esquimalt <coughs> does not zone it in, then they either have to be forced to do it or the whole project, I guess, comes to a halt. It's at a halt right now. I mean, I shouldn't say it's at a halt right now. They, they, they continue to... <laughs> Spend money. They continue to let RFPs and hire people, so they're rolling ahead even though they don't have any zoned uh, sites for it. Um, but the other major thing that happened was that uh, MLA Andrew Weaver did some poking and prodding of uh, the two ministers involved, the uh, Minister Oaks of, uh, boy, social and uh, the money funder for the uh, regional districts and uh, Minister Corley Oaks, and uh, the Minister of the Environment, um, Minister Polak. So these are the two provincial ministers who are right. involved, okay. So they're in charge. They have the authority and they have the money. Okay. And uh, as I say, Andrew Weaver, you know, did some uh, questioning. Is there any flexibility here? If we, uh, could we buy some time? If we bought some time, would have put the, uh, would have put the money at risk? And anything, if you go back and look at Hansard, anything that was said by the, uh, by the minister, particularly Minister Polak, would be that, whoa, there's a there's considerable amount of flexibility here. The inviolate date, the no compromise date, is the 2020 federal regulation one. But in terms of funding and in terms of flexibility up to 2020, she, again, just seemed to be saying, give me a call. So as far as you know, the provincial government is willing to wait until 2020 for this project to be finished, which means there's lots of time for another look at the whole thing, and that's what Vic Derman tried to arrange uh, just a week ago, uh, yeah. uh, almost today. A week ago today. And, um, you know, when I, uh, you know, I had occasion at these uh, open houses to, uh, you know, talk to, to uh, Chair Bryson and uh, his uh, chief uh, executive official, I forget his name, but anyways, uh, when, you, when you ask them about it, has there been any pushback? Has there been any, you know, uh, seeking of... of um, you mean, has the CRD tried to say, let's have another look at this? To let's the have a look at this. Can, yeah. we, can, we buy, you know, can we buy 12, 20 months? That sort of thing. Yeah. And the response is always, are you saying that we should put the uh, federal and provincial funding at risk? Is that so what you're asking me to do? this is the response from the CRD, up even though the money is not at risk. No, no, a sec. This was the response up until Andrew Weaver seemed to get clarification that there is some room for uh, 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 flexibility in the deadlines and flexibility and, and uh, assurance that the money would still be there. So up until Andrew Weaver's, you know, sort of getting this opportunity, there was never any response. There was never really any comeback to this sort of grave face of the CRD. of the CRD saying, 
we, you know, are you saying we should put this at risk? There's, there's no comeback there. But now there is. Now the comeback is, have you phoned Minister Polak? Have you phoned Minister, have you read Hansard? Have you phoned Minister Polak and said, hey, what about this flexibility that you've been talking about? What about this uh, assurance that the money will be there even though we run 12, you know, uh, up to 2020? Have, has the CRD done that as far as I know? As far as I know, they haven't done that. All they've done is gone to the CRD and asked for more authority to push a squamalt into shape. So last Wednesday, um, which was the 14th of August, uh, Vic Derman, who's on the CRD, put forward a motion yeah. to basically have... It was a four or four, it was sort of like a three or four fold motion, okay. right? Ca call a pause to so, it. So stop for a while. Stop for a bit. Okay. Uh, no more RFPs uh, going out. Okay. Um, and um, and uh, have uh, have a, another sort of call a call for um, what are they called? Yeah, proposals. To, proposals to, to look see, at what else is out there. To see if there's a better way of doing yeah. this, a way that works better for us. Expressions of interest. Yeah. So what he wanted to do was stop for a while and see if there was a better plan available. And this was voted down. Oh yeah, and not not just voted down. We went down there. I was with part of a, a delegation of uh, you know. You're only allowed 180 seconds to speak. So yeah, what can you do in 180 seconds? So we got six of us together to put together an 18-minute presentation. And it was kind of interesting because Mr. Floaty and friends were, they were sitting directly in front of me. They preceded us. And it was really kind of ironic that Mr. Floaty and friends, you know, very, very zealous, ardent environmentalists would get up there and speak passionately, pushing for a really low-end secondary treatment. That's what they were passionately pushing which is, for. Which is the current which plan. Which is the current it's plan. It's not a good plan. I don't think it's a good plan. I think we can do much better. The problem has always been it would take a bit longer. Um, you know, another 33 months. And so uh, we get up there and push forward this plan saying, we think that the secondary treatment plan currently on, uh, as being proposed by the CRD, is just, you know, it's a bad plan. We are proposing a plan for tertiary by 2020. So you just watched Mr. Floaty and friends sort of, they were kind of taken aback because they were attacking an old enemy. And the old enemy, they're still around, are the people who say basically, you know, our current uh, marine-based secondary treatment is fine for this foreseeable future. But a lot of us have moved on from that. I mean, I, you know, who am I to disagree with six, you know, environmental scientists up at UVic who say the current system, out at, uh, uh, the current marine-based secondary treatment is is sufficient so so the scientific view seems to be that even what we're doing right now just putting it in the ocean is not that bad yeah that's so i just want to go through who so so victor man put forward a motion basically put this plan on pause <clears throat> and let's take a look to see if a better if something better is possible now he voted for that um, Barb Desjardins of, San Esquimalt. of Esquimalt voted for that. Um, Graham Hill yeah. of View Royal voted for that. And Carol Hamilton, the mayor of Colwood, voted for that. Right. Now, the supporters of the current plan all voted against it. And I just want to read out the names. It was from Victoria, uh, Ben Izzett, Pamela Madoff, Dean Fortin, and Jeff Young. So again, they support what we're doing now, um, which is what many of us think is a, an overexpensive disaster. Ben is it, Pam Madoff, Dean Fortin, and Jeff Young. And from Saanich, Leif Wergland, um, is it Susan Bryce? Mm -hmm. Frank Leonard, uh, who's the mayor of Saanich. I guess they had, and, and then uh, just those three, right? I don't know. I yeah. just know the four who voted against and it. And as well as um, Denise Blackwell. Oh, yeah. Uh, of Squam Souk. Of Langford. Of Langford. And, uh, and Lillian Spack of Langford. I think Blackwell may be from Souk. But so there were the votes. Those are the people. And it's essentially Saanich and Victoria that are pushing this ahead. And I really don't understand why. Who are they representing? Because CFAX did a poll almost the next day. And the question was, now that Vic Derman's motion has been voted down 
and it looks like the CRD is moving ahead, do you think we should just move ahead? And 84% of the respondents to the CFAX poll said, no, we yeah. shouldn't be moving ahead. So if it's 84 saying, let's not move ahead with this plan, who are our representatives, our, our city councillors from Victoria and Saanich, who are they representing? Are they representing themselves? Or are they representing the people who elected them? I mean, what's going on with these, with these city councillors? Well, I mean, the, there was an interesting uh, <laughs> editorial in the Times Colonist, and the, the, the def they came to the defense of the people who are not budging on this plan. And uh, they said, essentially, that they were compelled to put in place a plan by the provincial directive and by the you know, federal uh, authority. Which is absolutely not true, because those things can be changed. Well, um, I mean, it's, this is not the word from God. No, it isn't. They can be challenged. They can be, and that's what, and that's exactly what Andrew Weaver started to do. Yes, it looks like uh, land-based sewage treatment is um, going to happen. Okay, so let's move on and let's look at the best land-based sewage treatment possible. Yes. And our argument is, and by when? Not 2040, not 2030, but 2020. So the debate, the, CR, the uh, Times colonists said that there are the, there's this impossible divide, there are two solitudes that will never come together. And uh, that's nonsense. I mean, we're really close. The only difference is 33 months with respect to time, and are you going to settle for a very low-end secondary that will continue to pump 50 to 90 percent of the toxins into the ocean, or are you going to go for a dockside-like tertiary treatment of 10 to 20 uh, um, tertiary treatment sites in and around uh, so the CRD. So there will be 10 to 20 sites spotted around the city instead well, look of one at, big one. If you look at the numbers, you mean look at Dockside Green at capacity will serve 2,500 people. It costs 4 million. So if you go from 2,500 people to 250,000, you multiply by 100. So you multiply 4 million by 100, you get 400 million. The trouble is, then you've got 100 Dockside Greens. That's a lot especially given nimbyism. So you have to bring that 100 dockside green-like facilities down to between 15 and 20, which you can do. And you can make half of those could be built on existing um, pump stations, like Curry Road. So convert Curry Road pump station. Looks like a nice house in Oak Bay near Windsor Park. Absolutely. Uh, convert that into a dockside-like green uh, tertiary treatment facility. So I think what we're saying is, maybe we can do better. Why would the CRD vote down a plan put forward by Vic Derman just to see if there's something better out there? They, I don't know what's wrong here, but, but something is. Well, I mean, there, I mean, again, I go back to the TC article, right? The TC editorial trying to explain this, and it's, you know, they use lines like, well, and, um, and evidence is in the eyes of the beholder. It's your respected scientist against mine. And I read that like three or four times, and I thought, Am I reading Fox News here? Am I listening to Rush Limbaugh? I mean, a line like that, you'd read, you'd, you know, you'd read from the Tea Party. I mean, you know, shame on the TC for even suggesting such a, a way of thinking. There was something else you wanted to talk about, so let's move on to that. Okay. And it's the sensible BC is moving ahead with the referendum about legalizing or something. What they want to, they don't want to, they want to de facto uh, decriminalize simple possession. Full disclosure here, I'm on the uh, Liberal Party of Canada in Victoria um, executive, and as you might know, our uh, uh, Justin Trudeau came out in favor of legalization. So you can get an idea of where I'm coming from. But Sensible BC is a, a, is a provincial initiative uh, trying to get over the next, in September, from September to November, trying to get 10% of the, of the signatures of the voters in each riding to force a referendum. And the referendum would basically be held the following year and it would ask the province to step down and no longer enforce uh, the, mar the federal marijuana laws uh, regarding uh, simple possession. So you'd have a de facto decriminalization. The request is take the resources that are currently, you know, the time, the money, the energy that are going into, you know, putting teenagers, uh, you know, arresting teenagers and giving them a criminal record. Go down and, you know, chase, you know, chase down the bad guys, you know, yeah, that sort of thing. Don't waste it on that. So I'll just show once again the uh, headline in the Globe and Mail. Oh, yeah. That's from today, Wednesday, August 21st. And basically it says... 
ease pot penalties police urge. So this is the police chiefs from across Canada voted unanimously, except for one person, Who does to, uh, to start giving out tickets. To, at the discretion of the arresting officer. Yeah, instead he or she. of arrests and yeah. criminal charges and all this stuff that is such a disaster. So the figures though are quite striking, Jack. I mean, you think, you know, as a lot of people do, ah, you know, nobody gets busted for pot in BC. Yeah. Not true. In 2010, BC police charged twice as many people with marijuana possession than they did in 2005. So in five years, it's gone up 100%. Do you know the, the actual numbers? Over 3,500 British Columbians were charged with simple possession of marijuana last year. So that's 3,500 people who are potentially left with a criminal record. And I suspect a lot of them are young people. And the federal government is about to put into place laws that if you're caught growing a few plants, it's mandatory. That's where the uh, chief police or the, the police chiefs wanted some discretion because if, well, there's two areas. There is simple possession, yeah. write a ticket. But they also wanted some relief from this minimum of, uh, you know, I don't know, you get three years in jail for more than six, growing more than six plants. So they're changing the people who, currently there's 35,000 people in, uh, in Canada who are licensed to medicinally grow marijuana to uh, address a, you know, a whole variety of ailments. Now those 35,000 people as of next March will lose that right to grow a couple of plants you know, in their basement to make medicine out of, they're gonna lose that right and be forced to uh, buy it from, uh, I'm not sure who will be supplying it, pharmaceutical companies, I have no idea. So if everybody can Google Sensible BC um, and get an idea, they, they, uh, the leader, uh, Dana Larson, mm -hmm. uh, is coming to Victoria in the not too distant future to speak and to try to gather volunteers who will, give, who will have to do the job of collecting signatures, which is very important in this process. It's hard to do because the only initiative of this type that's been successful was the, um, the HST. HST. Yeah, the NDP uh, were the ones who brought in the legislation that we can do referendums under, and the legislation was brought in in a way that makes it almost impossible it's for difficult. the public to succeed. Uh, that's the way the politicians work, unfortunately. We're almost out of time. Any last uh, words? No, like I say, I would encourage people to come out and uh, give Sensible BC a hand, and I would encourage them to continue to find out uh, why the CRD, the representatives uh, at the CRD are just doing what they're doing. Thank you for watching this uh, segment of Citizens Forum and thank you John Farquhar. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.